We begin with some news uh, just coming into us. The president has appointed current division chief at the IMF, Max Opoku, as the first deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana. Sources say Mr. Opoku assumed office this morning. Uh, George, your face following that story for us. George, when was the appointment made? Well, we understand that it was made as far back as last week and it was supposed to take effect of this, this morning. So uh, this morning he actually walked into the bank, showed his letter to officials there, and then he started working. Okay, so what do we know about this man, uh, Maxwell Opukwa Fari? So before he was appointed into this position, he was a division chief at the IMF, more of uh, one of their senior directed. He was, he was also responsible, or I've had several missions to when, for instance, the IMF comes to Ghana to review Ghana's performance under the program, mm. that team is headed by a mission chief. And Maxwell was a mission chief uh, for some several countries, about four of them. Before that, he was also a chief economist at the IMF, serving several capacities. He's been with the fund for almost eight years. Now, let's come to Ghana for those who want to connect to him. Just before he moved to the IMF, he was a personal assistant to uh, the former governor, Paul Aqua, at the Bank of Ghana. Before that, he was also a senior economist at the Bank of Ghana. Now, let's also backtrack a little bit. He was also an adjunct professor at one of the investors here in Ghana, where he was also lecturing as well. So uh, that is what I can uh, tell you more about uh, Maxwell, a uh, doctor, actually, Dr. Maxwell Pukwa Ferry, a uh, doctor in economics, actually. And he's actually assumed this position as uh, the first deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana, taking over from Melissa now, who actually retired recently mm. uh, from the Bank of Ghana. Quite experienced there. Um, what do we know about uh, the decision that went into selecting him and uh, what's going to be his role as first deputy well, governor of the decision, Central Bank? I think it's more of his international exposure and there mm. were other guys on the table who are so very, very, very experienced. We were also hearing that uh, one lady was also in contention for this position but never ruled that out because there is still some vacancy. Uh, at the Bank of Ghana, we could soon hear a lady being appointed uh, to join the top hierarchy at the Bank of Ghana. But also, we also understand that his big work in his international exposure was one, being an economist at the Bank of Ghana, also part of the team that led the reform at the Bank of Ghana during the term of Dr. Paul Aqua. So he has that institutional memory, and therefore, they thought that it was good to bring him on to help with the monetary activities at the Bank of Ghana. Okay, so let me just uh, try to bring this up, uh, his links with the IMF, any relations as Ghana is trying to, you know, work out his program with the IMF? I think that if you look at the uh, state's government's posture right now, this whole argument about the IMF program, and even whether it should be extended or not extended, and even the back and forth and all those things, that would be the last thing that this government would do in trying to bring in somebody from the IMF. But I think that his experience was a, was a big factor, and what he did when he was here at the Bank of Ghana was also a very big factor in considering to uh, finally settle on him among the other four candidates who were also strongly in a position to be selected as first deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana. All right, George Yafe, thanks Thank very you much so indeed for that update. So you heard it, the Bank of Ghana has got a first deputy uh, governor. His name is Dr. Uh, Maxwell Opoku Afai. Now, we are moving to the post now. Of course, uh, news unfolding from there as well. The rollout of the pilot paperless system failed to begin today at the Tema port as anticipated. Vice President Dr. Mahmoudou Baumia, if you remember, last week announced the commencement of a pilot paperless system today ahead of the September 1 deadline. Now, this forms part of a three-phase policy reform to remove trade barriers and make Ghana's port competitive. However, Joy Business understands there was a no-show today. We'll get some clarity from the Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority on what's going on there. But first, a report on the initiative. The rollout, which is being done on a pilot basis, is ahead of the full implementation of the process from next month. The new clearance process would include the attachment of documents and the GCNet system for onward transmission to customs for further action to be taken on those documents submitted. This would be complemented by scheduled process flow to be utilized by customs officers to notify relevant government inspection agencies to make themselves available for the joint inspection procedures at the ports. These steps, which are to be automated, will be supported by an alert system via SMS and emails to all agencies. Joy Business understands the Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority has already started the automation or call it paperless for the clearance process. Therefore, this rollout by GCNet will provide support for goods clearance and exports and it's expected to complement the process. However, 
For some exporters engaged by Joy Business, their concern is not with the automation, but rather the different regulatory agencies that they have to deal with in securing clearance for their goods. Joy Business understands GCNet integrated its systems with terminal operators and shipping lines such as the Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority, Meridian Port Services, Thema Container Terminal and others for the exchange of electronic data. Well, we are working the lines to get the public relations manager of the Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority to get some explanation as to why uh, the pilot paperless system did not commence today as and when we do. We'll speak to her. But still, uh, on this subject, economist Dr. Eric Osei-Sibay is urging government not to cancel the contract of the two IT solution and technical operators of the single window platform at the Temaport. He argues that any move by government to abrogate any of these contracts between the two agencies will send a bad signal to international investors. The two operators, GCNet and Westbrook Consulting Limited, who are said to be in a tough war over implementation of the National Single Window Program were recommended by the World Trade Organization to streamline operations at the port, but many importers and exporters of the view two separate agencies must not run a single window due to its adverse effect on port operations. In an exclusive interview with Joy Business, Dr. Sibe, however, thinks each one of them should have a clearly defined role in the process of efficient services. If the, the abrogate it, it's rather going to have that kind of negative signal. But if you allow the status quo to go and overhaul it. Two agencies operating. Sorry. Two two agencies. Agencies. Yes, so now what they have to do, that is what I talk about the overhauling. You know, making their rules dis clearly distinctive. You know, distinctively assigning rules so that we reduce the overlapping and waste of resources. It is very important that the, the minister sits with them, the ministry sits with them, and define clearly the rule that will not make it overlapping. And that will also significantly not impede trade. You know, because where you have overlapping rules and duplication of efforts, and uh, you definitely will, exporters will have to go through, or importers will have to pay this and that and that, that go to increase you know, our export competitiveness and also increase the cost of importing and all of that. So they have to really look, look at it. I don't think it should be of necessity cancelling it, but making sure that each one plays a specific role that is uniquely theirs and to complement one another in effort to facilitate trade at their borders. Moving on to energy issues now, and the Water River Authority, VRA, says it is hoping to clear Ghana gases debts by next month. This is what Joy Business has picked up from a senior officials close to the state power generator. According to the Ghana Gas, the VRA owes it more than $526 million for supply of lean gas for power generation. George Afe has more. According to officials of VRA, the proposed timelines for clearing all the debts could be finalized when they conclude discussions with the Finance and Energy Ministry before the end of this month, with the necessary funds to be released, possibly from September. The authority have also maintained that, apart from proceeds from the 10 billion city energy sector bonds that should be raised before the close of this month, there are other arrangements like using part of the energy sector levy to also pay down the debts. For some, if VRA is able to clear all the debts, it could go a long way to improve the operations of Ghana Gas. Now, this is because they have argued that delays in clearing the debts is badly affecting its operations. However, their fears whether all these debts could be cleared for next month. This is because some persons close to VRA have also argued that since Ghana Gas owes the authority, the debt clearance should be worked out in a way that will not result in VRA paying all the debts at once. Well, meanwhile, a fraction of initial gas from the country's third major oil field, the Sankofa Jinyame, uh, will be channeled through Ghana gas pipelines to fuel the country's thermal power plants. That's according to the CEO of Ghana Gas Company, Dr. Benasante. It comes in a wake of concerns, the lack of appropriate infrastructure to process gas from the Sankofa field deprives the country of some revenue. 
Now, speaking at a media session, Dr. Asante Arabo explained gas from the field is the dry kind which require no processing before transmission. He also expressed worry about the frequent breakdowns of the Jubilee FPSO and its impact on gas supply to Ghana gas for power generation. Yes, I am worried. I think uh, everyone should be worried, including you. I think, I think that the fact that um, one of our critical supplies of gas um, for thermal generation um, will be having some unplanned outages of supply is something that we have to handle. Um, Talo, as you are aware, have been having some issues with its turret. So it is affecting the reliability of the gas supply. But I think over the months, they have been doing very well. I think uh, initially when it started, we had really frequent outages of that facility and therefore frequent curtailment of gas supply. Um, what we do is we try to store some gas within the pipe. Now gas is not like oil where you can put in a tank. So we store this gas in the pipe at pressure. So it gives us some hours of supply before we actually go to zero flow. So we do try to make sure that we have some transient gas in the pipeline that we can use to address those outages. Okay, so, so I don't know whether it's enormous, but currently, as I mentioned earlier on, ENI's gas does not need any processing onshore. So it joins the our main pipeline, which is the Atuabo to Takwadi pipeline midstream. And currently, we are just doing about 25% of its capacity of that pipeline. ENI comes through, we'll be close to about 80% of that capacity. So if there's any incremental flow beyond that 20% capacity that is left, then we may have to think about actually installing a new facility, what we call a loop along the current existing infrastructure. In other news tonight, uh, government has been engaging the private sector on practical ways of meeting its macroeconomic targets by the end of the year at the 2017 Ghana Economic Forum. Senior Minister Yao Safumafo says government is intensifying its strategy to make the private sector more competitive to ensure the creation of jobs. Here's more in this report. The forum saw key business leaders mostly from the banking sector in discussions with government on the best ways of easing the cost of doing business in the country. Senior Minister Yao Osafamafo was the guest speaker. So the government situation today is far more difficult than it was in 2001. For 2001, the stroke of a pen was $6 billion were written off our debt. So we are comfortable from that angle. The World Bank, it therefore, cannot understand why Ghana should get into this situation now. When well, Washington is able, we we're trying to get some special support, the president of the World Bank says, there's a new phenomenon in the developing world led by Ghana in what we call reversibility of the economy or irreversibility of the economy. That you can go grow to the level of 14% or 9.3% without oil. Without oil, your GDP is 9.3%. You have oil, then you come to 3.5. That creates a problem for people to understand. But we are there, and we should manage it being there. And one thing I'm sure is that the problem is solvable. Joy Business caught up with the former Minister for Trade and Industry, Ecospiel Gabra, who disagrees with government. He argues government's economic targets are bound to burden the economy with more debts. You can't cut taxes without expecting your revenues to fall. So when they were removing taxes, which looked, which looked politically exciting because taxes are being removed, the bottom line is that you don't end up with the revenues you wanted because you have not created any additional revenue sources and then you can't meet your expenditure expectations. The Vice President. So you can't employ people. 
as Vice President has stated that, I mean, moves are being put in place to ensure that deficits to GDP is reduced to about 3 to 5 percent come Fantastic. next year. Fantastic. Is this attainable? No, anything is attainable if you want to cut things all over the place. And at what cost? You can attain any, any targets you want. Right now, the government is obviously attempting to the best of its ability to meet IMF imposed targets. So you want to bring the budget deficit within a certain range. You want to bring inflation down to a certain level, etc. But you do that at the cost of human beings, at the cost of, um, in some cases, prices that are being felt by the Ghanaian in the marketplace, contractors that are not getting paid, some public servants who have also not been paid for some time. The problem for this government is they are over promises. We shall do this, we can do this, we can do better than the other government. So people are going to say, wow, that sounds fantastic. Why don't we give them a chance? And they come in for six months and they find that they are sweating. The two-day event is under the theme, Building a Ghanaian-Owned Economy 60 Years After Independence. Now, government could turn to investors outside the country for some $1 billion next year. This plan was outlined in government's medium-term debt management strategy document for the next two years. But could the eurobond sale increase the public debt, which is currently at about 138 billion cities as of June? Here's a news desk report. According to government, the planned eurobond sale is part of several options being considered to help finance the budget deficit which government has projected in the 2017 budget to spend 13.2 billion CDs more than revenue collected. This overrun is to be financed and that is why this option is being considered. Sources say full details of this eurobond could be outlined in the 2018 budget, which will be presented this November. If government goes ahead, it will be this administration's first eurobond sale and possibly the fifth by this country. But the problem has always been at what cost these funds will be raised. The last eurobond issued to raise some $750 million, the country was paying an interest of 9.25%. So the current stability being enjoyed, could the country get a lower rate and what about the decision by U.S. Federal Bank to increase its interest rates and the possible impact on the cost of eurobond? The country's debt stock has reached almost $138 billion as of June this year. So if this fund is not used in a way to reduce the debt, then that could increase it eventually. According to the finance ministry, as captured in the debt management strategy document, government is planning to issue more long-term debt, possibly a $1 billion, 10- and 15-year bond, as well as some 3- to 7-year bonds. All these will be guided by borrowing at a very low cost and also trying to develop the domestic bond market. The document outlines strategies aimed at reducing the public debt in relation to the total value of the economy to 70% from 73% last year. All right, so let's take a look at what is happening on the stock market this week. I'm joined in studio by Bertha Tubiga. She's got all the facts and the figures. Let's begin from the markets. How are things looking at? Well, uh, thank you very much. Today the market did quite well. We had a mixed performance, two equities gaining and two equities losing on their previous share prices as close of which um, quotes on the stock market. And Ecobank and then uh, ETI lost a peso each. Ecobank closed at six cities, 99 pesos from 70 pesos, uh, 70 pesos, 7 pesos per share. And then we had um, ETI closing at 14 pesos from 15 pesos per share. Um, Enterprise Group Limited and Standard Chartered Bank continues to gain. These equities added a peso each as well to their previous share quotes. And we saw EGL close at 2 cities, 68 pesos. And then Standard Chartered Bank currently at two, 26 cities, 24 pesos per share. Last week, Standard Chartered added 3 pesos to its share price. And starting the week, it's gone up by a peso. And that's encouraging. It's actually one of the equities that we're looking out for to gain or add up to investors' capital this well, week. I mean, talking about the future, how do we uh, think things are going to play out? Uh, who is going to be the biggest gainer, <laughs> well, the losers? This week, uh, my expectation is that the market is going to continue to be bullish. Uh, we're going to see more equities trading. And for the financial sector, we're going to see some trades going on in Cal. Uh, Standard Chartered Bank, ETI, and SOGG, the Associate General. These equities are expected to move on the stock market. And if you look at the entire market, that's a broader market, we're looking at equities such as uh, FML, GO, EGO, uh, BOPP to also continue to gain on the stock market. And if you look at the close of last week, these equities have actually returned about, um, let's say, SCB, GO, 
and then BOPP are returning more than 100 percent with mm -hmm. BOPP doing about 142.31 percent year to day return so far on the exchange so these equities are expected to move or shift the broader market index upward or oh, that's a positive trend that we're seeing currently on the stock market so uh, the market is expected to be very bullish this week I love that word yeah. bullish yeah. well let's talk about the city's performance it seems to have uh, quite a good spell isn't it yes the city has been a uh, relatively stable if I compare it to last uh, two weeks ago and the last week uh, if you look at that's by the fact that it lost marginally to the dollar um, but gained to the euro and then the pound Sorry, it gained marginally to the dollar and lost to the euro and the pound. Now, if you look at the differences, it's not very, very significant. Like two weeks ago, the dollar was going for 4.3778, and as a close of last week, it was 4.3778. So you see the margin is not very wide. And then you look at the pound, which was going for 5.7284, 5 closed last week at 5.7507. And the euro 5.1080, closed last week at 5.1987. And if you look at the year to date depreciation, uh, that's how much the city has lost from the beginning of the year till now. The Gold Coast City Index measures 9.06%. And how is that having uh, an impact on commodities? Well, you can say that the commodity market has not been very volatile. We haven't seen significant drops or increments, but uh, with crude oil, the last time uh, we checked, it, was, um, it had this trend of trading below uh, 40, 40, uh, 50 US dollars per barrel, but as a close of last week, we saw it going above 50 uh, dollars per barrel. But it's not having a very significant impact because it's been relatively stable on the forex market. That's with the currency. All right, yeah. Bertha Atwiga, thanks as always Thank for the update. Thanks, uh, Bertha. We want to move on now, I believe, to our interview of the day. And well, Senior Minister Yao Asafumafu has been speaking to Joy Business. Uh, he's saying that government will not be capping employment uh, to the public sector. Interview of the day is brought to you by Echo Bank, the an African bank. Captains of industry, banks, and policy makers. And the three of us should fashion up a way of domesticating the Ghanaian economy, the way of arranging the system in such a way that Ghanaians take control over the development of this economy. You talked about uh, the public sector being overburdened and possible layoffs. Could you please express it? On the public sector obviously has no room for employment. No, certainly not. We can only employ more if we grow the private sector. That should be our aim. And nobody creates employment through the public sector. No economy expands by employing people in the civil service. You expand the economy by creating growth in the private sector which will give you uh, that elbow room to employ people. So uh, cool. After all, how many people can be employed in the civil service? Out of the 25 million Ghanaians, how many people can be in the civil service? So therefore, we shouldn't be expecting massive lay uh, layoffs? No, there would not, not be any layoffs from the public sector as such, but there won't be any additional employment within the public sector. There won't be any additional employment. Interview of the day. And thanks for watching our program tonight. My name is Daryl Kwa. We are back same time tomorrow.